Dick Cavett Show with Congressman Shirley Chisholm, Beverly Sills, and Bob Rosengarten and the orchestra. Ladies and gentlemen, Dick Cavett. Hi, neighbor, hi, neighbor. What do you know and what do you say? Dick. <laughs> Dick. I've always wanted to, I've hated guys who open shows that Dick. way. I've always wanted to do that. Dick. Wasn't that dreadful? Hi, Rosengarden. Don't sing. Oh. <laughs> just think, I got that out of my system. Who used to bounce on that way and, oh, I just thought of his name. I won't mention it. Here are your uh, cards, folks. Have I shocked you? Huh? What have you? What are you on? Oh, I'll 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 run down in a minute. <laughs> My son Dennis wants to know if he could choose your ties for you. <laughs> Listen, stop spritzing me about my ties. I, someone asked me if I, if I buy my ties at the Salvation Army. I do not. They give them to me. <laughs> Marie Ola, Mr. Cavett, is anyone else? You filled these cards out. I should remind you of that. It's probably been so long ago you've forgotten. Is anyone else here from Dallas, Texas? Joanne and Bob Westmoreland. Fine and Herb Hartwig. No, your secret is safe. <laughs> <laughs> Hope I didn't get you in trouble. Why are persons under 16 not admitted to your show? Uh, we don't want people in here younger than myself. <laughs> Gee, I don't know how I do this. Have you ever heard of Chicopee, Massachusetts? You can't say that on television. <laughs> are you kidding? Where are you from Chicopee? You thought I made that up, didn't you? Dear Dick, don't you wish everybody did? <laughs> Jeff, don't they? <laughs> hey, how, how do you like to take a long walk with me after the show? Uh, that sounds like a great idea. My going on it doesn't, but the long walk <laughs> sounds nice. How, how would you like to be Raquel Welch's pillow? <laughs> Does that mean something I don't know? <laughs> what makes you laugh? I'm gonna have to... Uh, succotash makes me laugh. <laughs> I don't know why, but it does. What do you think of the love machine? I think of the love machine. I think it's a, probably a very fine and vastly underrated novel would be my opinion of the love machine. That, that is my opinion, as a matter of fact. Might change after I read it, but... <laughs> <laughs> Who uh, are you most frequently mistaken for? It's odd, I'm either mistaken for Gregory Peck or Buddy Hackett. Just <laughs> bounces back and forth. I don't know what it is. Are you a Mets lover? Uh, yeah, well, in a sense, yes. I respect the Mets. I don't love them. I... <laughs> are you curious or are you yellow? <laughs> I, I think of myself as gutsy apathetic. <laughs> Why doesn't olive oil ever go on sale? Robin Mack, that's a great question. <laughs> what is that? The, uh, the reason olive oil uh, does not ever go on sale is that there are so few secondhand olives. <laughs> Don't know what it is. I should never drink coffee before going on. It makes me weird. Are you in relation to Robert M. Cavett, who's a beekeeper in Muncie, Nebraska? <laughs> no, but I once had a case of the hives. <laughs> Listen, if you want funny answers, write them on the card. Oh, now they're getting good. May I kiss you, Marsha McGill? If you can reach me from where you're sitting, and kiss me. Mr. Cavett, may I give you one of my super coochie kisses? Oh, come on. This is from Shirley something. You're too coy, Shirley. I'm sticking with Marsha. <laughs> there are 15 girls from the Bronx, Dickie Cavett, who are after your body. <laughs> Fifteen girls from the... Listen, one fifteenth of my body wouldn't keep a bird alive. I don't know. 
Will you please sing your opening song, Little Dicky Cab? And he's no, I will not. That was a, that was a mistake from last night's show. Dear Shorty, oh, do they always provide you with a high chair at a restaurant? <laughs> Elaine Pappas, come in and insult me like that, Elaine, and then expect me to read your question on the air, huh? Fat chance. No more Elaine Pappas's can come in here. <laughs> Dick, have you ever had a ride in a glider? A glider? I'd like to know because my father builds and flies them, Steve. Uh, no, I have not ever done that. Let me know next time. Your father's high. <laughs> Over New Jersey. Gee, I'm, I should stop. I was really hot there earlier. Would you like to take three beautiful girls to dinner? Uh, I, I'm tied up tonight. I'm sorry. And do you like firemen? That's who I'm tied up with. <laughs> when is your next visit to Sycamore, Illinois? Um, you know how hard it is to get reservations there in the season. <laughs> I think, when you were a teenager, were you bothered by acne? I've never been asked that before. No, the true answer to that is that I was not. Acne was in style when I was a teenager. So that there was no problem. Dear Dick, will you marry me? Uh, no. There's no signature here. I don't marry people who don't sign signature. I can't marry you for a number of reasons. Why are you so rude to Mr. Rosengarden? I'm not rude to you, am I? Yes. Really? Yes. This is not rude. Yeah. This is not true. This man, I love Mr. Rosengarden. Oh. That's why I can't marry you. <laughs> as a matter of fact. I, wait a minute. Have I been out here long enough? Strange things are happening. Tonight's guests are, are two, as a matter of fact, we could call our show tonight Two Girls from Brooklyn. It's an amazing thing. Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm, remarkable lady, uh, is here with us. and. Uh, Beverly Sills, the greatest singing actress, I guess, that the opera has ever produced. So there'll be two ladies and me, and we'll be back after this message. This, who put the duck in my desk? Several people have commented that I need a sidekick on the show. <laughs> and this thing showed up at the office. It's a nauseating little toy. <laughs> it's a duck with a red ribbon on his neck and a blue shirt and yellow pants and orange shoes. It's Liberace's duck. <laughs> and somebody, I'm supposed to press his button on his chest. This show's really gotten classy, hasn't it? <laughs> This thing almost beat Ed McMahon out for his job. <laughs> Who gave me this? <laughs> this is not my style of toy. How do you stop it? Oh, you push the button, huh? Isn't it a sweet little thing? It had the last laugh. <laughs> hey, we're gonna roast you for dinner. Let me, okay, knock it off now, kid. There. I think it was probably meant for Walter Cronkite. I don't know how I got it. Adorable and terrible little thing. Oh, listen, Beverly Sills, my next guest, Beverly Sills, I must get serious for a moment, is probably known as the best of all prima donnas. Until a couple of years ago, she was known only in opera uh, to her colleagues uh, as a great singer, and suddenly she burst upon the scene. They knew what they had in Beverly Sills' great talent. Uh, a music critic recently advised New Yorkers, or visitors to New York, to skip the Statue of Liberty in the Empire State Building and to see Beverly Sills. She is, uh, we're really lucky to have her here. Uh, Want to knock the duck off now? <laughs> I think if you just let it run down or immerse it in a bathtub. <laughs> or something else that'll disturb the plumbing. <laughs> let, me, uh, let me read you this. Uh, the Times, Harold Schoenberg said, um... <laughs> good, good. Uh, said about Beverly Sills, she was everything. This is when she appeared in Manon and just stunned everyone. 
the New York's, uh, it was Winthrop Sargent, actually, uh, of, uh, who said that she is a great lady, the operatic world, beautiful, flawless as a singer, formidable as an actress, that there are three superstars now besides Nilsson and Sutherland. Miss Beverly Sills, a fine, fine singer. This is no pile of chopped liver. This is a high-class broad. <laughs> What's wrong with me? Will you welcome a great star if she's still here, Beverly Sills. We aren't La Scala, but we're something. <laughs> I'm afraid my introduction lacked majesty somehow. Well, but... I wouldn't say that. No, okay. <laughs> Maybe later we can clear up why the last time you were here, Pat McCormick called you Bubbles and the audience laughed. Maybe later. But now for adults only, a fairy tale that always leaves you with a happy ending. All right. Hello again. Hello We're again. back. Yes. Beverly Sills, in case you just joined us, which was to be silly of you. Shop liver queen. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, well, maybe we should clear that up. That's an odd thing, because you have this distinguished career, and you sing at La Scala and all in New York, of course. And um, there was a time when you were known as Bubbles. Is that right? More people have written in and wanted to know what that was about that night. Well, when I was three years old, I was a burlesque queen. <laughs> Go on. <laughs> Everybody says that. How, do you, how does that, what does that mean? There's really nothing to it. I was born with a big uh, spit bubble in my mouth, and the doctor just said, oh, look, bubbles. And so I was called bubbles as a, a baby. Well, how did Pat and McCormick know that? <laughs> that can't be Well, the real he knows story. my mother very well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but little. weren't you known as bubbles once in, as a kid performer? Yes, I was known yeah. as little Bubble Silverman. Yeah. And I was... Uh, <laughs> I That's thought that was sweet. Sort of sweet. I was one of the first children to uh, ever be televised in the United States. In the world, I guess. Really? And uh, we were on a, a program called uh, Stars of the Future. Mm -hmm. And uh, I found a poster from this, and I, one of the other stars was Gary Grafman, the very the world-famous pianist. Mm -hmm. And... Um, uh, Gary, I think, was a little bit older than I, so that I was really the youngest child ever to be televised. So they decided, in those days I had not yet changed my name. I wasn't the big star then. So I, uh, I stayed with Bubble Silverman, and that was the way the poster read. And so that, my husband calls me Bubbly, mm -hmm. and my mother calls me Bubbles, and my brothers call me Bubbles, and so I guess, why shouldn't Pat McCormick? Yeah. <laughs> and you may call me Bubbles. Okay. <laughs> I noticed that in, uh, you played, you were at La Scala, and to me that's a world just that I can't comprehend. I think of it as a place of giant temperaments and people throwing their hands in the air and ripping their clothes and true. throwing oh, true. spaghetti into the air and walking uh, <laughs> off stage. And the, I just think the opera is such a giant world of temperament. Was, did you find it that way in La Scala? Well, I'm probably the first singer that had the ceiling fall down before she ever sang there. I think the day they announced that they were bringing in an American to sing an Italian opera, the ceiling fell down. They had to close the opera house. <laughs> That's a true, the, the literal ceiling Literally, fell, it fell in. down. They had did they to, ever figure yeah. out why? Well, I just think the fact that I was coming to sing got them terribly upset. <laughs> because when I arrived, they were still uh, very upset about... Uh, well, for instance, they decided to conduct all the rehearsals in Italian. It, it seemed to be an unwritten law that no English was to be spoken to see when I would cry uncle. And huh. apparently another singer who had preceded me had asked for an interpreter. And she, every time she didn't understand one of the stage directions, she would say, what do you say, honey? So as I walked into the first rehearsal, all the ladies in the chorus were saying in funny phonetic English, but I got the message, what do you say, honey? You know, they had learned it. They learned it. So I thought, well, I'm not going to cry, uncle. I'm just going to go on. So I, I did the best I could. By the fourth day, I was holding my own. But those were three of the longest days of my life because apparently I was saying very funny things and terrible things, and they spared me not. You, One quarter. You have to speak all those languages, don't yes. you, to be able to? Well, French is, uh, actually, I spoke French before I spoke mm -hmm. English, by a funny quirk. But, um, <laughs> but I do speak French fluently. And uh, I speak Italian now fluently, let me tell you. <laughs> it's just, it was live or, or die with them. They were very nice after I had my first orchestra rehearsal. Yeah. Um, and I 
sang my things and the orchestra stood up and applauded me, which is very unusual in La Scala. Mm -hmm. And from that moment on, uh, I was in. They couldn't touch me. Nobody could That's do That's a magic it. sign. That's it. Yeah. Everything I asked for, there were 10 people running to do. And um, as a matter of fact, I had one strange thing. The, the head of La Scala, who was uh, the boss over everything, he really mm -hmm. is autonomous. Everything he says absolutely goes. I've never seen anything like it. Said to me, you know, uh, Signora, they are waiting for you to have a, a tantrum. They, are, they think that you're too nice and that everything is going too smoothly and it's making them very nervous. Really? They, they so missed the I nine o'clock tantrum? Well, <laughs> I said, everything is sort of nice. I have nothing yeah. to complain about yet. And he said, well, as soon as you do, complain in a very loud voice. And I said, it's hard for me to be loud in Italian. He said, well, that's the chance to use your English and get them nervous. <laughs> so I waited for the dress rehearsal. And suddenly, a scrim was lowered before me. And I, I a know. A scrim is a very thin curtain, right? A gauze, that's right. And actually, the audience cannot see it, but it enables the lighting people to do very strange lighting effects. Mm -hmm. And it has a terrible psychological effect on me. I, I simply feel as if I'm singing in cotton. And I thought, here's my moment. So I walked, put my nose up right against the scrim, and Thomas Shippers was the conductor. And in English, first very quietly, I said, Tom. Are you prepared to follow me for the next two and a half hours because I can't see you? Which wasn't true at all. And he mm -hmm. said, well, well, no, I'm not. And then he looked at me and he said, so yell a little. <laughs> I yelled and the scream came up. I never saw it again. But I had my, my big tantrum at La Scala. I don't blame you. Everyone knows that singing through gauze would strain your voice. <laughs> You may use that during an opera I sometime. <laughs> my That's, I'm very, goodness. very ashamed of it. Oh, my sentence. I just thought of something. Yes. Don't you feel that um, lo spettacolo è un aspetto più naturale quando è contato nella lingua originale? Come no. <laughs> but you made sense. Did you understand yes, that? Yes, I understood. I learned, sometimes when a guest Who is on... Who told you to say that? Gina Lola Brigida. Did she really? <laughs> yes. Well, she was coming on the show, and I wanted to learn a sentence of Italian. There was an yes. article about opera, and the sentence says, uh, for our non-Italian friends, don't you feel that the performance has a more natural quality sung in the original language? And that's the only, I learned that sentence. It it's doesn't get me very far. It's hard ordering a meal. Yes. Uh, <laughs> restaurant, but, it but certainly they didn't think get I'm, you very far with Gina Lola Brigida. <laughs> how do you know? <laughs> <laughs> do, do you feel uh, strongly about that problem in opera, that the, whether the music should dominate uh, the acting or the acting dominate the music? Well, I, I really feel they must have an equal share, although mm -hmm. I will sacrifice a, a musical tone to get a dramatic effect. I have done that and been knocked on the head for it, but I still do it, and I will. Who knocks you on the head? The purists who think purists, that the songs yes. Are... Uh, if I do a bel canto opera, I, ha I recorded uh, Roberto de Vereux, which is coming out very soon, mm -hmm. and uh, there was a word... Uh, this is the story of Elizabeth in Essex, and she is sending Essex to the guillotine because she knows she has a rival in the court and he refuses to say who it is. Mm -hmm. And there was one word, and the word was va, which precedes an aria that she says, go, go to your death, you deserve it. Yeah. They wanted me to sing it, and I wanted to just scream out the word va, and this was on a recording. And the argument went on for 20 minutes, and I said I was sorry, but I was going to do it my way. And they said, well, you know, bel canto means beautiful singing. And I said, yes, an opera means drama with it. And so we fought, mm -hmm. and I won. And now we'll see what they do to me when it comes out. But I, I just uh, feel that uh, two hours of beautiful singing is very pretty and very boring. Yeah. And um, I read a book Rossini wrote the other day, and he said the most important thing in opera is voice, voice, voice. And I think that's bore, bore, bore. But mm. uh, if not bull, bull, bull. Not huh? bull, bull, bull. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I do believe uh, there are times when I lean more towards the drama of the piece than, yeah. than the music. I think everybody knows the music, and everybody knows I can sing pretty notes. And if, if that's all they've come to hear, I can mm. do that in 10 minutes and they can go home. Why sit two and a half hours? Yeah. People are really taken with your acting. I, there was that funny story, I don't know if it's true, that it, was it in Manon in the seduction scene? Or the, in some, one seduction scene you were doing, and and being terrifically seductive, and is it that you convert the man from... Well, uh, I, I, yes, he has be he's just about to take the final vows of becoming a priest. Ah, and you and seduce him away from that. Yes. And a lady in the audience was heard to say to her husband, Sam, she's making him crazy. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that was nice. Do you know that story? Is it, I hope it's true. Don't tell me if it isn't. <laughs>
I don't know how to bring this up. Someone said to see if the phrase stinking smut would mean anything to you. Now, I was told to say that. I hope yeah, it means this something. isn't a trap. No, no. It's, what is it, that it was about? in the days when I was doing the big dates mm -hmm. for $100 a night, going to uh, big places that, like uh, outside of Kearney, Nebraska. And I wasn't big enough to come into Kearney. I was oh, in the were, outskirts. You're still in the suburbs of still Kearney, were you? Still in the suburbs you? of Kearney. And when I arrived in Nebraska, they were having a, um, a plague of hoof and mouth disease with the cattle. Oh. And this little township, which made its entire uh, existence out of cattle. I'm glad you had, clarified the disease was in, broken out among cattle. And yes, the, yes. Uh, yeah. um, uh, had nicknamed the hoof and mouth disease stinking smut for obvious reasons. Or at least they were obvious to me when I got to the town. But <laughs> oh. in any event, I was singing in a high school auditorium, mm -hmm. big time. And they uh, had a two-page newspaper. And on the front page, there were two photographs. One uh, was a picture of a dead cow. And underneath it, it said, Beverly Sills comes to sing in high school auditorium tonight. <laughs> and the other picture was a picture of me. And underneath it, it said, stinking smut invades Nebraska. <laughs> A, Those were the happier days of my career. Well, this was before or after you sang. <laughs> before. Oh, sorry, what a greeting from Nebraska. I come from Nebraska. And those Do things, you really? Yeah, I, I knew you were authentic because most people say Kearney instead of Kearney. So. No, no, I've been through all that. I've even sure. been to Palestine, Texas. Palestine? And I don't call it Palestine no more. <laughs> you learned. You, you were a kind of child prodigy, uh, I guess. And how did you keep from being a brassy little monster like child prodigies self and are? Uh, well, because I don't think my parents were uh, aware that they had a child prodigy and they really mm -hmm. didn't care particularly one way or the other. I, my father um, wanted all his children to be well educated and my mother, I was the only daughter and the youngest and she thought she had a nice doll to play with so she would make all my clothes and dress me up and then she decided that all little girls should learn how to sing, tap dance and play the piano because they're very important <laughs> graces to possess. Mm -hmm. And in those days, which is so many years ago, uh, the uh, dancing schools used to be attached to radio programs. They had Uncle Bob's Rainbow House and Uncle Don's Children's Hour and the Horn and Heart Art Children's Hour, and mine was Uncle Bob's Rainbow House. And so I just kept appearing on it every Saturday because my father would take the boys either to a ball game or to a Turkish bath or, you know, spend the day with his sons. And my mm -hmm. mother spent it with her daughter, and she thought that was a nice way to to keep me busy. And so it, it just sort of snowballed very slowly, but when it came time for me to go to school and high schools, and my father insisted I go to a public schools and mm -hmm. get a, my normal education so that uh, the singing took place in between and I was yep. never aware that I was um, performing in public. Uh -huh. And uh, also in those days there weren't live audiences uh, on the programs I did when I went on Major Bo's Capital Family. The, uh, uh, Applause was on a record, you know, I don't know ah, how you so call you it, dubbed in. Yeah. So that I never realized I was performing for anybody but Major Bowes, and he always had milk and cookies for me, and he gave me a little elephant for good luck. And, you know, it was a party, and then it was as if he said, well, sing me a little song. So I sang him a little song, and I went home. So I never had any idea mm -hmm. that I was on any kind of nationwide, um, yeah. even when I made that funny Rinso commercial. Even when you I, sang Rinso White, no, you didn't, Rinso it. didn't go to your head, did no. it? No. <laughs> we, uh, oh. Now a word, speaking of things going to your head, now a word from the bowl cleaner with more active cleaning ingredient than the other leading brand. I didn't know what I was saying. Santa Flush. Here's another amazing lady. Uh, last January, Shirley Chisholm, Chisholm took her seat in the uh, House of Representatives and it was a remarkable political achievement when she went there because she's uh, the first black woman ever to be elected to that august chamber, as they're always saying. And it was uh, remarkable because the, the odds were given quite heavily against her when during the election, and she won. And she gave the impression quite firmly that she could not be bought or bossed and convinced her constituents, and apparently it's true. Uh, I met her before she, when she was sort of on her way there, was new, and um, I have not seen her since. It would be nice to see her impressions now that she is an actual congresswoman or lady congressman. I don't know what you would say. Will you welcome, please, the Honorable Shirley Chisholm.
I, I find your title very confusing. Uh, I don't, do I say Mrs. Cong... Miss, Miss, you're, a, you're a Mrs., so do I right. say Mrs. Congressman or Miss oh, Congresswoman? Or no, uh, just Miss, say Congresswoman. Congresswoman. Yeah. Don't proceed right. it by any Mr. or Mrs. And do you sound the L in your last name? No, I do not sound not the at L. all. It's Chisholm. Well, then why do I sound the L in your last name? <laughs> <laughs> we can figure that out. Um, you were saying when you, when you went down there to Washington that... Um, Oh, well, first I want to I talk about this. You got a bit of a surprise when you got there. You were put off into an area that you had not expected to go into. Could you tell about that? Oh, yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, when I got to Washington, of course, my reputation had preceded me. And the fact that I came from an urban area didn't seem to make too much difference to the gentlemen. They proceeded to place me on the forestry subcommittee of the agriculture committee. <laughs> <laughs> and it was very difficult for me to accept this assignment, although the tradition was and is that freshmen should be seen and not heard. I realized mm -hmm. I came from an urban area beset with many problems of poverty, unemployment, and housing, mm -hmm. and that to place me on a forestry subcommittee didn't have any relevancy to any of the concerns of my particular area. You mean and you I had no experience in the vast farmlands of Brooklyn? And Absolutely the <laughs> none. Absolutely none. I think that the only thing that the gentleman seemed to recognize or knew was that a tree grew in Brooklyn. <laughs> and, uh, she was going to take care of it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it, it be, I, I told him that uh, I could not accept the assignment and that I would, and in a caucus, I did something that had never been done before. I protested in the caucus. Was that with Wilbur Mills? With Wilbur Mills. Mm -hmm. And uh, Wilbur Mills uh, gave me the opportunity to make my grievance known to the caucus. And then uh, at the very end of giving all of the reasons why I could not accept that assignment, he says to me, uh, will the gentlewoman from Brooklyn withdraw her demand in terms of being placed on the agricultural committee? And the men told me later that they knew I would say, yes, I would withdraw, because you just do not uh, say no to Wilbur Mills. He's been known to say no to presidents of this country. Mm -hmm. And when I said, no, I will not withdraw, you could have heard the sigh and the hush in the chamber. And mm -hmm. I, I wondered what had I done that was so wrong, because I was only going according to the reality of my own particular constituency. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, a few weeks later, the caucus met again, and. They placed me on the Veterans Affairs Committee, but at least there are more uh. veterans in the district and forest. So it's just more money. That's right. <laughs> Besides your own distinguished military record. Yeah. Uh, but can you do something there that will uh, be fruitful and oh, relevant? Oh, I, I believe I believe I can because uh, all over this country I am getting letters from black veterans and Spanish-speaking veterans that have very unique problems, mm -hmm. and they've never had anyone to really specifically address themselves in that August body to their needs. And so I think I will find a place uh, on this committee in terms of helping a particular segment of the population in this country. Good. So, so they didn't put you away entirely? No, I think they? they thought they would put me away because it was primarily male business. Do you, do you really? Do you run into that resentment of uh, a, a woman being able to do a man's job? Oh, that yes. is. Oh yes. This is this uh, question of uh, male versus female is quite a problem in America. Mm -hmm. When you contrast this with other nations, you don't have the same kind of hang-up. This country needs the utilization of its best talents, and that should not be judged on the basis of whether you wear a skirt or a pair of pants. Right. It should be judged on what you have up here. But there seemed to be a great deal of difficulty that women's talents in this country can be used to push men into different offices and what have you. But when it comes to projecting the women, that's another story. Yes. You know, the, the feminists, those really rabid ones, have gotten um, the uh, sex specification taken out of advertising now, I believe. And they cannot specify sex in an ad. They have to, to discriminate against women. Uh, I don't know when that started, but it's in the Times advertisements. There, there have been jokes about it, like because of that, Hugh Hefner has gotten stuck with a lot of male bunnies. And like that. Um, but they're very strong uh, about that. What disappointments did you have, if any? I don't know if you had any, but you went to uh, Washington full of true grit. And uh, I wonder if there's any sense of uh, being slapped down or unable to do the things you thought you could. Do you have any sense of disappointment? Uh no, let me say uh, I've had my frustrations, and uh, 
But I went to Washington, in a sense, prepared for some of the things that I did meet, because after all, I did have the opportunity to serve in the New York State Legislature, so that gave me mm -hmm. a kind of background. But the thing that has shocked me more than anything else is the strong entrenchment of the seniority system, a system oh. where men uh, and women, by longevity of service only, rise to the tops of committees. Uh, mm -hmm. And they can be as moronic as can be, but the fact that they have been there for such a long time mm -hmm. gives them the opportunity to be chairman of a committee. Mm -hmm. And we have such dynamic, we have some very young, dynamic men in the United States Congress right now that have so much to offer this country in terms of creativity and resourcefulness to meet the problems this region. Name and some, yet, so we know mm -hmm. who they uh, are. Brock Adams from Washington. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this fellow from uh, Rod Steiger, Steiger, oh, I said Rod, I was thinking of the yeah. movie stars, so yes. my brain's now for another reason. But Mr. <laughs> Steiger, <laughs> Mr. Steiger uh, from Wisconsin, uh, William Fitz Ryan from New York, uh, Cassin Meyer from Ohio, these are men that really have talent and have something to offer, but cannot really offer anything because they've not been there long enough to be given recognition. Uh, and it seems to me that in this day and age in which we live in America, we need a combination not only of experience, because experience is important, Dick, mm -hmm. but you need a combination of experience plus particular talents that a congressman or a congresswoman brings to that house. And the gentleman just say, no, you wait your turn. They told me, you know, they're never going to put, I wanted to be on the education committee. And I knew as a freshman that uh, perhaps I wouldn't get it, but I thought by giving them a long list of my credentials, having three degrees and being on the education committee, et cetera, but it didn't make any difference. No, they, they said, you know, be a good soldier and wait. You know, be a good soldier. Yeah, be a good soldier. The Speaker of the House, a lovely old gentleman. He's really quite a nice person. <laughs> but he he told me, you know, Mrs. St and he laughed because I said to him, how ludicrous can you be, Mr. Speaker, placing me on the forestry subcommittee? He said, you know, Mrs. St it's really funny, but be a good soldier and wait. Hmm. You know, it, it's hard to understand, but you, you begin to acclimate and adjust yourself to certain things, but you don't ever really accept them. And I, I am not really accepting a lot of things. I'm still working to bring about certain changes, no matter how minute they may be. Good for you. What, what kind of social life can you have down there? Uh, I know that when you were in the, uh, when, when you were in the New York, um, when you were serving in New York, the, the New York legislature, you didn't, uh, I read somewhere that they didn't always take, include you when the guys went out afterwards to talk. They felt a little strange about <laughs> having you come along. And, uh, do, do you have this in No, in no, uh, no, I, I, I don't. Uh, because recently I went to a cocktail party. You know, Dick, I'm a pretty regular woman, but you know sometimes the way, the way papers play things up and what have you, you get the feeling that here is this woman, this feminist coming through waving the banner, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, you know, you better stay away from her, you know. And recently, in a cocktail party in Washington, uh, we were having some cocktails and we were conversing and what have you, and they put, put some music on. And one of the gentlemen said to me, uh, well, Mrs. Chisholm, let's take a few steps. Uh, not realizing that I was a dancer, he really thought that because I had been classified as a kind of intellectual and an isolate, that maybe I didn't even know what to do when I got on the floor, you know? Take and he said, steps. let's take a few steps. Mm -hmm. And I said, certainly, because, because I love dancing. I really love, I've run, won three prizes for dancing, and very few people know this. <laughs> so when he said to me, let's take a few steps, we went out on the floor <clears throat> and we started to dance. And after a while he said to me, you don't take steps, you really move. <laughs> 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 and uh, so that, uh, there, there are other aspects to me as a personality uh, that people mm. really don't know about. I'm an accomplished pianist. I play the piano quite well. I've studied music for 12 years. But it's because in this society I have had to fight to make my way in politics, although I've been connected with politics for 19 years, being the ghostwriter for many of them. And I've had to fight merely because I was a woman. Mm -hmm. So then the men tend to look on me as a certain kind of aggressive, abrasive female, but I'm really very tender and cuddly and what have you. I really <laughs> <laughs> Should we tell this to Mr. Mills? <laughs> or Mr. McCormick. I thought maybe the story was that one, it was one of the older committee heads who asked you to dance and he only could take a few steps. <laughs> no, but there's a wonderful campaign slogan for you. She doesn't just take steps, she moves. She moves, mm -hmm. correct. Oh, that's a very that is good. wonderful... Uh, <laughs>
I, I would think, though, that there's a sense in which by being the first black congresswoman, you would be kind of a novelty down there and that your time could be eaten up by the fact that they would like you as a sort of, uh, you know, decoration at parties and things because oh, yes. you are I've, I've run into, filling an unusual position. Yes, I've run into this. This question of being the first black woman to go to the United States Congress has almost, in a sense, be, uh, been a desire on the part of many people to place me in a glass cage for exhibition purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, I think many people forget that First of all, and most basically, I am a human being, mm -hmm. and that I'm no different from other you know, human beings. But I recognize the role that I am playing and why the kind of concern about me right now. But thank God I have a sense of humor. And yeah. this is the thing that really helps me so much from day to day. I would think it would. Mm -hmm. You can laugh off not being oh. invited to lunch immediately by yes, Strom Thurmond. I, I, perhaps you'd like to. <laughs> I think, you, I, I think you'd like to hear a story if I, I have time. I'd sure. like to tell you a funny story. Okay. Oh, wait a minute. We have yeah. to take a message now Certainly. so we don't cut into it. Sure. We'll be right back. And the story is... Well, uh, sometimes the house has very long sessions and there's a private dining room for the members. Mm -hmm. And I did not realize that these... Uh, dining room tables are reserved for certain delegations and I went down one day and was getting ready to eat lunch and I you know sat at the Georgian delegation table and I did not know this and while I was eating and uh, re looking at the reading the paper this gentleman s stood up over me and he looked at me and he said Miss Chisholm you at the Georgian delegation table uh, and I said sir what is it you're saying you're at the Georgian delegation table I said there's no reserve sign etc he said, well, you know, here in this body, we all have our special tables. I said, look, there are three empty tables right here. They belong to other delegations. I'm eating my lunch. I'm enjoying it. After today, I will not sit at this table now that I know it belongs to Georgia. But if you cannot sit now and have your lunch with me at this table, I would suggest you take one of the empty tables. And if indeed anybody from another delegation asks you to rise from those tables, I will be the first to support you and help you. You understand? <laughs> When they do the movie of your life, I want to play you. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> Gee, thank you for coming. That's really good. Um, Miss Sills. Sir. <laughs> we have time for that one other superb number from you. Do you feel you have it in you? If you really want more music, we're having such a nice time. Sure. have to spoil it with music. <laughs> think of it as a privilege. <laughs> <laughs> First the duck and now that. <laughs> Whose idea was that? That's, that's a corruption of your beautiful instrument. It's so true, but they went through such expense to orchestrate it that I felt I couldn't turn it <laughs> Really? That's why we had all the strings here? Just that's right, that, all was that, it? yes. Oh, that's really something. Well, thank you. I, I feel singly honored, as singly. well as humiliated. <laughs> thank you both for being here. We should do more shows with two ladies from Brooklyn. <laughs> we, um, I don't suppose you knew each other as kids. <laughs> no, uh, I don't no, 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 no. Where do you Although go? Although my grandfather and grandmother, when they came to this country, settled in the Bedford Stuyvesant district on Herzl Street. Oh, so I'm very familiar yes. with Bedford Stuyvesant district. That's yeah. right. We well, may find that there is a trace of something in our backgrounds. Let's, you and I get together after. I we think may find we should check on that. <laughs> That'll be a strange investigation. <laughs> Thank you both for being here, and please don't either of you get discouraged in what you're doing. You. We have, uh, <laughs> as future guests, we have William Holden and Eartha Kitt and Robert Morley and the great B.B. King, and I don't know how many others, probably none. And we'll, we'll be back uh, on, on the next night that we're on. Good night. This is Fred Foy speaking. We invite you to join us tomorrow night for the Dick Cavett Pop Rock Festival. Dick's guests will be the Jimi Hendrix Experience, Jefferson Airplane, and Joni Mitchell.